All right, we're preparing to stream live to YouTube. All right, and we're officially live on YouTube. I'm gonna put the link in the chat. For all of you who are tuning in, if you wanna spread this to your community and get out the word to um, anyone and everyone, share this link. So YouTube link to share the presentation. So it's in the chat now, and it'll also be available after the fact um, if you wanna share it, you know, far and wide and make sure as many people as possible hear about citizen science. It looks like if one person's raising their hand, Julia Lane. Julia, um, if you have a question, drop it in the chat for us and we'll make sure to get to it during our presentation. Okay. All right. Um, so we're one minute out, um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and start sharing these slides. Um, to answer Stephanie's question, you should be um, watching on Zoom. If you were able to put in chat that, that comment, it's better for you to stay on Zoom, but we also stream it to YouTube because we know some people just don't have Zoom on their computers. It's a little bit, it may be more accessible for people to just watch it on YouTube. The difference there is on YouTube, you know, when there's live polling that you'll see soon in this presentation and um, questions and answers that we'll have, um, you won't be able to post those questions on, on YouTube. That only happens here in Zoom. Yep, and we'll be monitoring the Zoom chat. So if any of you have questions as we present, just let us know. For those of you who have joined us already, it'd be great if you could drop in the chat who you are, where you're calling in from, your zip code if possible, so we can keep track of who we're reaching. And if you feel like it's something you're interested in learning about during this presentation. So yeah, please introduce yourself in the chat. And I'll go ahead and let Darlene introduce herself and get us started. All right, I'm just gonna put on my Facebook wall real quick, the invitation for people to watch on YouTube. Come watch Citizen Science. I don't know. <laughs> um, Darling, I'll post it from the SciStarter page to make sure as many people come join us as possible. That sounds great, okay. And so far on, is uh, YouTube a little bit delayed? You'll yes, see it's about one second delay. Okay. All right. Hi, everybody. And Caroline's going to tell me if I'm ready to go. Yep, we're sharing. Our, I'm sharing the slides. So, um, yep, people can see the slide. Okay, look at all these awesome people weighing in in chat. I don't know if our panelists can see that too. This is great. Christy from ASU, people from Illinois. My God, it's coming in so fast. Pasadena, Sierra Vista. Well, you can read them all. This is so cool. It's so neat to be reminded that we're apart, but we can connect like this. And this is exactly what Citizen Science aims to do too. So great to welcome everybody here. My name is Darlene Cavalier, and I'm the founder of SciStarter. You'll see and hear about SciStarter throughout this presentation, but basically it's a way to help people connect to lots of different projects and events. Basically, if you're curious or concerned about something and motivated to take action, citizen science will match you with scientists who need your help, even community members who need your help. And you'll, you'll see what that means in terms of the tasks that are typically done with citizen science, but it's, it's easier than you think. I'm also a professor of practice at the School for the Future of Innovation and Society at Arizona State University. I work a lot with people at Arizona State University, including some of the panelists that you'll hear from later. And what we do is we try to make it much easier for people to discover opportunities, to fully engage in science, basically shape the future, make the future what you wanna be, want it to be, 
through science and your engagement in science. And then also we look at barriers that currently exist that don't make that so easy for people to either discover or join or stay engaged in these projects. And then we build research and development projects around that. Today we're um, here to, because it's Citizen Science Month and we're very fortunate to have support from the National Library of Medicine and our friends at the National Network of Libraries of Medicine so that we can bring lots of these opportunities to you through libraries all through the month. Now, I don't have to tell you that it's been a very trying month for everybody around the world and librarians have not been immune from that. And sorry if you've been furloughed, if you're, if you're out of work, um, I know these are trying times. Super thankful that you've been able to join us here today because the world continues to move on and it turns out there's still many, many ways to make use of the great resources that, you're, that libraries have I don't need to tell our librarians on the line that from public libraries to research libraries to academic libraries and, and everything in between. And for the patrons, the public, members of the public who are tuning in as well, don't forget your library still has resources available for you, digital resources. And that's partly what we're gonna go through today to help you find those resources as well. Um, and maybe it will inspire you to get a library card because a lot of these things do hinge on you having a library card to access the, the information. So for starters, I'm going to start with a reading of a short introduction to the Field Guide for Citizen Science. The Field Guide is a book that I wrote with um, two of my co-authors who are also experts in citizen science from SciStarter. And the idea here was to just try to make citizen science more mainstream. We want people to see this book, which was published by Timber Press, in um, airports, you know, gift shops and bookstores, and, and they're seeing it now. We see these, um, you know, side by side with other kind of mainstream books. And that's exactly where we think citizen science belongs, out in the mainstream. The idea behind this book was to basically bring SciStarter to life, bring the pages off of the website, um, help make it easy for you to understand step-by-step -step instructions, not only how to do the project, but why you might wanna do that project. In the book, you'll hear from the scientists who run the projects. You'll hear from community members and citizen scientists who are able to affect change from the bottom up. And um, we hope it leaves you inspired to get involved on your own. So Caroline, if you would like to start sharing some images, I'll go ahead and read from the Field Guide to Citizen Science, how you can contribute to scientific research and make a difference by Darlene Cavalier, that's me, Katherine Hoffman and Karen Cooper, AKA the experts at SciStarter. Many times in our lives, we may be filled with an urge to explore and discover. We may be curious about everyday encounters with bird songs or spiders and webs, or we may be concerned about air quality or the safety of our drinking water. As we face global challenges, we may wanna find local ways to make a difference in protecting endangered species, safeguarding marine systems, preventing disease, and accelerating medical research. Sometimes finding solutions through discoveries requires a lot more eyes, ears, and perspectives than scientists possess. Put simply, citizen science is a collaboration between scientists and those of us who are curious or concerned and motivated to make a difference. Citizen science can satisfy that urge bring joy and purpose to our lives and advance a surprisingly diversity, uh, a diverse range of scientific research. The Field Guide to Citizen Science book can help you discover opportunities to be an explorer, to participate in this movement that's sweeping the globe. Yes, the globe. If you are surprised to hear about the burgeoning popularity of citizen science, you're not alone. Conventional science frequently takes place out of sight with methods and outcomes that remain a mystery to most people. Compare that to sports, art, or music in which we watch professionals perform in public view and then take part as amateurs in our lo local sports leagues, art gallery, or garage band. There's no ex expectation that our participation will or should lead to professional careers and pursuits that we enjoy. By putting science in public view, Citizen science makes it possible for anyone to participate with or without a formal scientific background. And Caroline, 
Ah, there we go. I was just wondering if the video is playing. Thank you. Citizen science brings science within reach by connecting two critical ingredients, you and scientists who need and value your help for authentic research. Typically, scientists provide instructions, protocols, and procedures, as well as the equipment and structures to guide you in sharing your observations. Observations are what you see, what you hear, what you smell, what you track, count, and tally. In return, you provide scientists knowledge through your observations and insights or analysis. Data that scientists cannot access, collect, or analyze alone. Increasingly, citizen scientists are also setting the research agenda by identifying issues they care about and then tapping scientists to assist with the development of the protocols, interpretation of data, and translation of that data into action. Today's opportunities to participate in citizen science are boundless. Odds are there's a citizen science project that coincides with any hobby, interest, curiosity, or concern that you have. People, matching people and projects appropriately is essential to success. Along with the 50 plus projects featured in this book, we'll show you how to discover thousands of opportunities in the citizen science projects most suited to you by working with the SciStarter website. You can use it to discover, join, and even track your contributions to projects. With SciStarter as your online assistant, we encourage you to treat this book as your field guide and the beginning of an exploration into citizen science. Some participants collect data by taking photos of clouds or streams, documenting changes in nature, counting litter on their local beach, or doing projects from home. Other citizen scientists use low cost sensors to help scientists keep an eye on local air, water, and social conditions. Countless others collect and send in microbes, track flu symptoms, even track COVID-19 systems now, I mean symptoms now, and play games to help advance health and medical research. People just like you and just like me are counting birds, butterflies, and other pollinator populations. They're helping NASA track landslides, ground truth satellite data, monitor, monitor noise and light pollution in our communities. In short, by working together, we better understand our world and we can make better decisions. We sincerely hope that once you start participating in the projects featured in this book and on SciStarter, you'll share your experiences with your friends and your family, and perhaps even inspire them to become citizen scientists. Witnessing the transformation in people who realize they are capable, entitled, and needed gives us such a sense of joy and accomplishment and inspires us to work harder to reach more people. And once you get the bug, once you get involved, you'll see exactly what we mean. Okay, Caroline, let's take a look at the slide that helps people understand how to get the field guide to citizen science from your local library. Many libraries have hard copies, but we know many libraries are closed right now. So let's take a look at um, the way to access digital versions of this. And Caroline, you might actually have to read it because I can't see that whole slide. Yeah, I'm happy to. So accessing the field guide to citizen science through library e-media. So every library is different. I think we all know that. And um, you know, your local library is your local library and it's definitely gonna be awesome. But one of these ways is probably the way you might access it from your local library. So number one, you can look for these ser services through your library's website, our digital download services that link for free download version. So there's Libby slash Overdrive, Freeding, Hoopla, and Cloud Library. So your library may give you access to these services. So please check your library's website. You can also look for apps that your library might use on the Google Play Store or Apple App Store. And um, if you go to your library's website, there are help and FAQ links for supported device devices and um, download support. So I think the best way is eMedia to access things right now because of course many libraries are closed um, in the physical sense because of public health guidance, but we urge you to engage with your library digitally and get the field guide to citizen science. Thank you. Okay, Caroline, I think what's next? Are we going to engage in one of these projects in real time? Um, let's do a quick poll. Okay. Just to see um, where our audience is at. So I'm gonna quickly exit full screen. So we just wanna hear a little bit about you and your experiences. 
So we're going to launch our first Zoom poll. And for those of you who are watching on YouTube, you can't participate, but we'd love if you could chime in in the comments. Launching our poll, have you participated in a citizen science project before? So please vote in the poll. Oh my gosh, right now the no's are winning. Oh, it's about 50-50. All right, last chance to vote. Get your votes in. Three, two, one. Last chance for real. End poll. Ooh, it's about 50-50. And the so no's win. The not sure's, you have a chance to tip the scale. <laughs> <laughs> all right, our next question is, we just want to know who you are. So we're going to launch our poll. Are you an inspiring, aspiring citizen scientist, a parent of an aspiring citizen scientist, a teacher, educator, troop volunteer, et cetera, a librarian or part of a library staff, a board person on the internet, or none of these? Perhaps you're all of them. All right, let's get those votes in. All right, last chance to vote. Three, two, one, end poll. Share results. Oh, all right. Good stuff. Two two percent are bored people on the internet. Ah, oh. well, we hope this. We hope you have fun here. Um, I have a conundrum. What do you do when your National Science Foundation program officer is calling you in the middle of a live event? Sorry, Bob. Okay. <laughs> All right. What's up next? Send uh, money. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna do our demo of stall catchers. Um, so just to quickly show you, you can access stall catchers, the project we're about to do and lots of other projects that have been specially chosen to do from home in your backyard are in conjunction with your local library. So all of these projects are great fits for library programming or home are just engaging from home. So we're going to go to the scistarter.org forward slash NLM page. So the NLM is the National Library of Medicine, and um, they um, and the editors at SciStarter help select these projects as the featured projects for Citizen Science Month, which is April, the month you're in right now. So we're going to go stall catchers. And if I was participating on my own, I'd watch this video up here and then read these instructions. But you guys are with me, so we're going to jump right into the project. Actually, right, Caroline, can you hear me? Yep. Can you go back one step? Um, and then just so people have exactly, they can find that page from citizensciencemonth.org. Yeah. I know we're going to go through that later, but just for, for grounding in case you get lost and you're not sure where, where to find all these things because SciStarter has so many different pages on it. Citizensciencemonth.org is a good starting place and you'll see lots of different information. Originally, we had these assets up there for in-person events and then Caroline did an amazing job of helping to switch these all to online events. So we have more than a hundred of those. But right where Caroline's cursor is here, featured projects. If you click explore projects, this brings you over to the scistarter.org slash NLM, National Library of Medicine page. Gives you information about their All of Us program, access to different things related, related to the coronavirus as well, and um, a, a tutorial to get you started in citizen science, very easy introduction, self-guided online tutorial to citizen science with a little quiz at the end and a certificate. This is great not only for new citizen scientists coming on board and families, but it's also great for librarians um, and librarians to consider putting on your websites too. It's just a very easy way to help other people become comfortable with citizen science. As Caroline was talking about, there's six featured projects here. These were all selected because they advance human or environmental health. These were selected in partnership with our friends at NLM. Um, of those six projects, we're featuring one during this, during this event, and this is where we click over to this one called Stall Catchers. This is a program to accelerate research on Alzheimer's, um, and as Caroline mentioned, the pages will look like this, step-by-step -step instructions, information about the project, and Caroline, I'm just going to summarize the information, and then you can get us involved in the game. 
But basically, this is a project out of Cornell University where researchers there spend a lot of time reviewing very short clips, video clips of blood moving through the brain of a mouse that has been infected with Alzheimer's. And what those researchers do is exactly what we're about to do in a couple of minutes. They just look through the videos and they look at the blood flowing and they try to determine whether or not the blood is flowing or if it's stalled. And the reason this is important is because these same researchers are, are working with new types of drugs to see, and they have started to show that as they remove the stalls from the vessels, memory is restored in that, in that mouse. So this is just one way of how you basically playing a game can help those scientists accelerate research. And we know from last year on Citizen Science Day, now it's a month, maybe someday it'll be a year, and hopefully at some point it's just a way of life. But on Citizen Science Day last year, um, we had lots of people playing this game and it absolutely accelerated research. Something at the minimum, and I'm probably undercutting this, it was the amount of work that our volunteers did in one weekend was the same amount that it would have taken those scientists at Cornell to do. It was either three or six months. So the savings in time is incredible. You'll see when Caroline demonstrates this project, you don't have to worry about being right or wrong. Of course, you want to do your best to be right. But it takes 10 people to say the same thing about that little micro clip that you're looking at. That has to be the same match before it's considered research grade data. So don't worry about getting things wrong. Just have a good intention and just do it. So over to you, Caroline. All right, so we're gonna do this project together right now. So you're looking at Darlene said at the video of a mouse's brain. Um, and we're trying to figure out if this blood vessel in the circled orange area is stalled or flowing. And um, I'm not always the best at this project. There are middle schoolers who put me to shame, um, but you know, that's the beauty of the power of the crowd. You don't have to worry about being right. So we look at the circled area and we look at that white blood vessel and we try to see if there's a spot in the white blood vessel that never turns white. It just stays black. That's how we know that's a stall. I'm gonna go ahead and classify this first one for us because I'm pretty sure it's flowing and I'm right. So we'll do and, it again. And can everybody weigh in on chat? Is that is that one way we can get feedback from our audience? Yeah, I think that's the best way to do it. Um, so, ooh, in this one, okay, so look at the circled area, everybody. Do you see any black spots that never become white in the flow of white? What does the chat say? Just say yes or no. Do you think this is stalled? A vote for yes is stalled, a vote no is flowing. We got a lot of yeses for stalled. They're pouring on in. All right, we're gonna say stalled. And this is the trick. Now you have to click on the blood vessel where you think it's stalled. So I think there's a stall right there. And I'm correct. All right, let's do one more together. And how did you know that you were correct? Um, it gives you an alert in the bottom corner right here. Okay. So look at the circled area, everybody. We want to see if there are any persistent black spots in the flow of white. And if there are, is that stalled or flowing? That's the stall. If there's a persistent black spot in the flow of white, white, that's a stall. Okay. So what do we think? Stalled or flowing, everyone? Vote in the chat. A no. If you don't think it's stalled, you can say no. If you think it's, um, you know, if you think it's stalled, you can say yes. Yeah. And we and might Car go ahead. Caroline, I was just going to say you can manually move that green dot. So if you get to a spot that you're not sure, you can go kind of go back and forth manually. Yeah, we can slow it down. Let's do some slow mo. All right, what, is, what do the people think? We're, oh, it looks like the people think a lot of no's. Um, so the people, it seems like they think flowing. So let's give it a flowing. And they're right. So we did this project together. I'm going to go ahead and exit stall catchers now. Wait, Congratulations, you everyone. You did real citizen science today. And before you exit, can you show the t like how they can form teams around their libraries? Because I see that you set one up for SciStarter. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and actually, um, Jennifer, um, we'll get to that later in the presentation. And she'll invite all of you to join the Scottsdale library team. Um, so you can either join Team SciStarter or you can help our other friends. It's up to you. Or you can make your own. We'll, we'll get to that later. Great. Thank you. Awesome, awesome. So now, Dan, do you want to take it away? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? 
Yep, we can hear you. Great. So my name is Dan Stanton. I am a research and engagement librarian at Arizona State University, where Darlene is a professor of practice with the School for the Future of Innovation and Society. Uh, and Darlene and I have been working together for about four years uh, out of ASU. So I also have a, another title with SciStarter of Director of Library Programs, because that's one of the things that we uh, kind of focused on. And I'm very thrilled to see so many uh, Arizona Library folks uh, in attendance. I appreciate that. Um, and so what I'm going to talk to you about today is kind of how you can uh, use the resources that we have um, at SciStarter uh, for doing introducing citizen science to your libraries. Now, I do not have a science background. I am not a science librarian, but I enjoy nature. I enjoy science. And so when I came across citizen science, I'd never heard about it four years ago, came across it, thought it was very cool, and thought it was just a, a great um, partnership with libraries, especially public libraries. So uh, next slide, please. So we uh, created a uh, um, we had a, a grant from the Institute of uh, Museum and, and Library Services uh, for creating citizen science kits and programming in public libraries. So that was a little over two years ago. And so what you're seeing on your screen now is citizens, our version of Citizen Science Day two years ago uh, with some of the six public libraries in the Phoenix area uh, that we were partnering with. And at that point, we didn't know what we were going to be doing. We hadn't designed the kits yet, uh, but our, our libraries rocked with these displays. They already had a lot of uh, resources in their libraries related to citizen science and a lot of other related programming. So uh, we put together a few new resources like that uh, little tree poster board there uh, and had people come in and talk about what they, share what they liked about science and nature and if they had done citizen science before. And then we also had uh, community meetings uh, in our libraries, of course, to kind of introduce citizen science and to uh, share um, what we were thinking about doing and what people's interests were in citizen science. So that was a, a couple of years ago. And next slide, please. So with the grant, uh, you can see here we had, uh, and you can go to this site, sistarter.org slash library. Um, and the information that we have on there, we started off with uh, three kits that we developed, uh, exploring biodiversity, bio, biodiversity, measuring light in the night, and zombie hunting. Uh, were the first three that we released. Um, and we, you know, worked with six libraries in five different library systems. So uh, you public librarians, I'm sure, can realize that's no small feat uh, to bring together um, different library systems to uh, work on a, on a common project uh, that they can all use. And the librarians were awesome. They cataloged the kits. They put things uh, into their online catalogs. Um, they did displays. They did um, promotional stuff. Um, and so you can see there, then we added a couple more projects. We added a Arizona a themed project called stream mapping. We do have streams in Arizona and it is uh, important to map them when they're flowing above ground. And then we had uh, monitoring air quality, which is an issue here in the uh, Phoenix area because we're in a little bit of a bowl. Um, so we added those two projects as well. And then just now, hot off the press, uh, and I'm not even sure if they're delivered yet because of the coronavirus, we just uh, created another kit called uh, Observing Pollinators, which is related to the Great Sunflower uh, Project. So. And and Dan, actually, we have a relevant question that just came up in the chat. Um, sure. Someone wants to know, what's the difference between SciStarter.org forward slash library and SciStarter.org forward slash NLM? Ah, good. 
So uh, SciStarter has the ability uh, to curate uh, different projects for different groups. So the library uh, slash library is for uh, our particular project. These were the, the um, projects that we selected for uh, our kits to introduce them and kind of uh, troubleshoot them here in the Phoenix area. Uh, when we partnered with the National Libraries of Medicine, of course, uh, they were helpful last year in um, promoting Citizen Science Day with uh, stall catchers that you just saw. And this year, they uh, supported it more. Uh, and uh, I think um, Tess will be going over that uh, a little bit later, but they have uh, specific health-related uh, projects as well. And they are not necessarily uh, linked to a kit that you would check out from your library. So that's a good question. Uh, go ahead with the next slide, please. So one of the things we found uh, all through this project is people were interested in citizen science, uh, but they weren't really sure what citizen science is. It doesn't quite roll off the tongue uh, and really draw people in. So uh, through the National Libraries of Medicine, uh, last year, uh, we created a uh, about a half hour tutorial introduction module called Introduction to Citizen Science that walks you through what citizen science is and how you use resources and how you do things. Because it, it, it sometimes gives people uh, the impression that, oh, no, I'm doing research. What if I mess up? Really, uh, what you're doing is a lot of what you normally do, you know, in your life. You observe things around you, you track things, hopefully, like you track checks in your uh, bank account, things like that. You're making observations, you're doing things like that. It's not that different. So this walks you through there, gets you feeling comfortable with that. And so this was created by an instructional designer here at uh, Arizona State University um, with the College of Health Solutions uh, as, a, as a good introduction. And we're kind of using it to um, balance out, uh, we can add kind of different components to this for uh, different uh, community groups that uh, may be interested and have a little bit of a, of a uh, different take on that. So next slide, please. So um, last year, uh, when we had uh, Citizen Science Day, um, it was it was a pretty big success, and we realized that it was, uh, you know, we were thinking too small. Citizen Science Day uh, and the the one hour event that we had uh, wasn't cutting it. We had groups of people in uh, uh, Nigeria that were doing stall catchers in the middle of the night. They were online with us, um, and so we went to uh, Citizen Science Month and. In keeping with the way that we were supporting and the success we had uh, with our Phoenix area public libraries, some of whom are, are uh, in the audience today, um, we felt that we wanted to, some of the things that are difficult for individual libraries and librarians to do are to create some of the promotional resources and bring people in. And so we have created uh, promotional and facilitation resources that are free to everyone and they are brandable. So you can add your own uh, library's brand on that, your city or town, uh, things like that, whatever it is that helps you to bring uh, people in. And that's the URL there, scistarter.org slash library dash resources. Next, please. And one of the, the big things that we uh, took a look at was um, to have a, a publication to help uh, libraries um, introduce citizen science to their communities. Again, it's something that's a little bit, you know, libraries do a lot of uh, partnering with other community groups. They do a lot of programming on their own, things like that, but they may not feel comfortable with the whole citizen science thing because unlike other STEM programs, citizen science is contributing to real research. So um, there, there is that uh, kind of sentiment behind it. 
and people got a little concerned about that. So we put this together. Uh, it was originally called the, the Library Guide to uh, Citizen Science, and that was quite successful uh, last year, and we just updated it earlier this year to the Library and Community Guide to Citizen Science because uh, there were other groups, um, not just libraries that were interested in doing uh, community programming. And this is a good way to uh, share uh, how to do partnerships with other community groups. So using the library as a focal point, again, a library is a hub of uh, citizen science in the community. Uh, this is an updated thing. And again, this is available for free um, on the SciStarter website. Next slide, please. So in addition to all the free resources um, we have and the curated projects we may have there, um, SciStarter has uh, over 3,000 citizen science projects. Now, as librarians, you know, it's very important to be able to narrow down a, a set of information like that. And so we have uh, project finders that you can go in by your uh, kind of activity, where your location is, uh, whether it's indoors or outdoors, whether it's completely online, whether it's for a particular age level. And you'll see on the right-hand side, there's an advanced search um, where you can narrow things down by age groups. Uh, some of them have classroom materials, curricular materials that um, have already been created. Um, and again, as this gets going and kind of catches on, uh, more and more project managers and researchers who want that interaction um, are adding these materials there. And that's the, the beauty of citizen science is it provides value for uh, both sides of the equation. The researchers get a lot of data that they wouldn't be able to get on their own because uh, they can't be everywhere at once. Uh, and people get to learn about these um, cool cutting edge research that's being done and actually contribute to it. So uh, SciStarter has ways of, uh, this is one of the ways that you can kind of narrow those things down. Next please. And so uh, in addition to uh, narrowing things down by um, topic or interest, there is an event finder. So you can go in there, uh, if you're interested in participating in something, um, you can find out uh, what's going on on particular uh, days. And I think I selected today there, I think in the lower left, uh, no, upper right there, that is us here today. Um, so you can put your events in there. You can, it can be totally online, it could be in a particular location, and that's a way that people can uh, find your uh, events and you can find other events. There's also, uh, I didn't put a slide in there for it, but if you see next to the little search thing, there's something that says map. You can go in there and you can take a look on a map to see where things are um, in relation to yourself. And you can also send, uh, SciStarter has the ability for people who are registered SciStarter users who have uh, okayed this ability, you can send uh, invitations to people in a particular area uh, to invite them to your program, um, things like that. So again, it's a, it's a good way of building community, people who are doing some of the same things uh, together uh, of sharing in each other's events and activities. And the next slide, please. So here's what's really cool too. So, you know, libraries transform big thing from ALA and ALA has been good about uh, promoting uh, this. Um, National Libraries of Medicine, uh, for the past couple of years, they've had this little because poster, uh, because anyone can be a citizen scientist and it's very cool. And because libraries are partners in a healthy community as well, all kinds of things and again, you know, I'm sure you all know you can grab those yourselves and brand them. And uh, for today, you know, now that we are online, uh, because libraries go where you are, uh, 
that's kind of a theme today. And it is not just uh, public libraries either. Uh, though, you know, in, in terms of our project, that seemed to be the obvious place to start. Um, school libraries are doing citizen science. And again, they tie things into the curriculum. Uh, we've been doing some work with them. We're looking to expand that. Uh, special libraries, of course, uh, you know, that are tied to um, observatories or uh, botanical gardens, things like that. They're doing these things, and those are great places for you to partner with uh, as you're doing some of these things. And academic libraries as well. Um, all kinds of libraries are interested in supporting uh, their communities in citizen science. In fact, just uh, in the past week, um, the Association of College and Research Libraries, uh, Science and Technology Section, uh, did had a webinar on academic libraries and citizen science. And I believe I saw uh, the host of that one, Megan Carlton, on, uh, in the audience here today. So a shout out to Megan for that. Um, for, you know, again, getting, getting the information out there, getting the conversation started and, and sharing uh, this information. So I believe that is my time. Thank you. I will turn it over to Tess. Hi. Thanks, Dan. Can everyone hear me okay? Perfect. All right. Hi, my name is Tess Wilson, and I'm a community engagement coordinator with the National Network of Libraries of Medicine in the Middle Atlantic region. Um, in this role, I mainly work with public libraries and community based organizations in our region. Um, and I deliver health information trainings. I help come up with programming ideas involving health literacy and health information. Um, and I provide funding opportunities for libraries and organizations. Um, but before this position, I myself worked in public libraries as an outreach and youth services librarian. So I'm particularly excited about the work I get to do with SciCerter because I love exploring the intersections of health, uh, community and our environment. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so before we get into um, the meat of my presentation, I just want to um, clarify who we are, the National Network of Libraries of Medicine. Um, so the National Library of Medicine is an institute of the NIH, the National in Institutes of Health, and that's the, it's the world's largest biomedical library. Um, and we make, we maintain and make available um, a big print collection and they produce electronic information resources like Medline Plus and PubMed, which you might be familiar with. Um, and so the NNLM, the National Network of Libraries of Medicine, is um, an outreach program of the NLM. So the NNLM is made up of eight regions. I'm from the Middle Atlantic region. So I serve Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, and Delaware. Uh, and our office is located at the University of Pittsburgh in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Next slide, please. So at NNLM, our mission is to provide equal access to biomedical information to health professionals, as well as access to quality health information for the general public. Um, so they're better able to make informed decisions about their own health. And so we do this through resources on our website, as I said, funding projects, trainings, webinars like this one. Um, and if you, if your library is not yet a member, consider joining. I'll give more information about that towards the end. Um, but membership is completely free of cost. Um, and uh, as a liaison for your organization or your library, you'll receive weekly postings about resources, trainings, um, a lot of citizen science updates this month. Um, if you're a member, I'm sure you've seen those rolling into your inbox. Um, but because of NL NNLM's mission, um, it's probably pretty clear why we work so closely with public libraries and why citizen science is a pretty natural um, evolution of our services with public libraries. Next slide. Uh, so the NNLM is a partner of SciStarter um, and on our crowdsourcing and citizen science page, which um, there's an image here and the link is right next to it, um, nnlm.gov slash national slash guides slash CCS. Uh, so on that page, you'll find resources for hosting citizen science events, um, 
a featured project that can be completely re completed remotely with not very many tools and resources like that library and community guide um, that Dan pointed out. Um, and that'll walk you through what other libraries have done and how to get engaged. So that's a really great landing page for citizen science with NNLM. Next page, please. Um, and these are just some of the SciCerter events that the National Library of Medicine has endorsed. So someone mentioned it earlier. These are the projects that are specifically at the intersection of the NLM and SciStarter. Um, Globe at Night is a really exciting project. I saw some folks talking about not being able to see uh, because of um, pollution and light pollution. Um, but Globe at Night, if you can see the stars, it's a really exciting project, um, especially now that it's getting warmer outside after dark. Um, you can participate by measuring the brightness of the night sky in your area um, and submitting your observations. Um, so using um, charts, you can compare how many stars you see uh, with how many stars you should be able to see. So your insight can help raise awareness of light pollution levels um, and can inform some solutions to keeping our night skies healthy. Um, so perhaps even in those especially polluted sky areas, your work is really important. <laughs> um, debris tracker is a great way to engage with your local land and water systems. Um, if you just record the location of debris in your area through the Marine Debris Tracker app, you can download it on a smartphone. Um, much like other citizen science apps, you can snap photos of your debris, upload them, and then you can see your own observations on a map. Um, and that helps researchers find solutions to preventing and cleaning debris. Um, and finally, Crowd the Tap um, is a great entry to citizen science, and it just requires a few items that you probably already have in your home. Um, by completing a simple survey about your home's water usage, your participation connects you with a network of other citizen science who are working towards clean water for all. And those are just a few of them. Um, next slide, please. So there are a few other NLM resources I'd like to point out today that might be useful for folks who are interested in citizen science, um, whether you work in a library or you're just looking for more ways to, to engage. So in collaboration with Cornerstones of Science, um, NNLM is offering the Test the Waters Family Exploration Kit, and that's available now during Citizen Science Month. Um, within each kit are four family-friendly science water-themed activities and all the instructions and materials you'd need to conduct each activity. So these are physical kits. They're designed for libraries, and if your library is interested in ordering one, you can order one until the end of the month. Um, Go if if you're worried about not uh, about shipping or anything like that because of the current situation, don't worry about it. Go ahead and order it, and we'll work that out as we move forward. Um, but you can just order that on the NNLM Citizen Science page. It's a, it's a simple form. Um, and for those not familiar, the Collaborative Summer Le Library Program um, is a consortium of states uh, and islands nations working together to provide libraries across the country with summer reading themes and materials. A lot of you are probably familiar with this initiative. Um, so 2020 is the second year that NNLM has provided health related programming to this project. So we sort of supplement with health literacy, um, the stuff that's already going on with CSLP. Um, so you can find links to materials, program ideas, and a resource list for a ton of great STEM and citizen science activities. Um, on that page on our website as well. Um, a couple of the programs that are included um, are a guide to owl pellet dissection, um, citizen, story citizen science story walks, and a whole lot more. Um, the NIH's Kids Environment Kids Health page uh, is another really great page full of interactive resources for young scientists and caregivers and library staff. Um, so take a look at that as well. And then finally, one of my absolute favorite NLM resources is Toxtown. Um, and this is a repository for health information relating to toxins and pollutants in our environment. On that site, you'll find links to tracking tools, guides to protecting yourself from pollution, and ways to get involved in environmental advocacy as well. Next slide, please. Uh, one more exciting NNLM collaboration is with the NIH's All of Us Research Program. Um, for those who aren't familiar with the program, I'll just give you a brief overview. 
Um, the All of Us Research Program is a 10 year long project and their aim is to build one of the largest, most diverse data sets of its kind for health research um, with 1 million or more volunteers nationwide who will sign up to share their information over time. So its mission is to accelerate health research and medical breakthroughs, um, which will enable individualized prevention, treatment and care for everyone. Um, so the goal of the program is to help researchers understand more about why people get sick or stay healthy, especially in marginalized communities that have previously be, been underrepresented in medical research. Um, so when someone decides to join the All of Us program, they're asked to share different kinds of information. Um, they might ask for samples, ask for access to health records. Um, next slide, please. So some of the ways that NNLM has gotten involved with this particular research program includes um, spreading awareness. We kind of serve as the conduit between public libraries, the research team and the general public. Um, so we've also teamed up to build the NNLM All of Us Community Engagement Network. Um, and that's a subset of our current network um, and of the All of Us Training and Education Center. Um, so this network is just part of a pilot project and it's going to focus on our mission to improve the public's access to information. Because um, as we know, partnering with public libraries can provide opportunities to improve community health outcomes through health outreach, um, programming, partnerships, um, and working directly with public libraries provides an opportunity to connect them with other NNLM members in the area. Um, creating or enhancing networks for disseminating health information and also addressing the particular health needs of their communities. Um, so that's why we've involved public libraries in this All of Us Research Program um, awareness. Next slide, please. So if your library is interested in getting involved in this particular research program, you can join us, work with us and lead with us. Um, to join us, you can become a member of the NNLM. I'd encourage you to do that regardless. It's a great resource and it allows you to connect not just with us, with trainers um, and webinars and classes, but with other members of the NNLM. Um, so that could be health organizations, clinics, et cetera. Um, and you can volunteer uh, to lead one of the All of Us Journey traveling educational experiences. Uh, or you can apply to um, get funding from us, from the All of Us Research Program in conjunction with NLM. And last slide, please. Finally, uh, in an effort to support libraries who wanna remain engaged with everyone through this pandemic, um, NNLM is piloting a virtual health programming series and that's gonna start in May. So we hope this will be a great resource for libraries who are interested in offering virtual health programming but might not have the capacity to do so. Um, these will be scheduled through August, 2020 and they'll be on a variety of health topics. Um, we'll have the series finalized then in, in the next couple weeks. So you can find out more information uh, at that website there, nnlm.gov slash all of us. I'd really encourage you to look into that. It's gonna be a great resource for, um, as I said, libraries who are looking to stay virtually engaged. Thanks then so much. Pass, before we pass the mic to yeah. Jennifer and Lisa, we had yeah. a question come in for you in the chat that um, Eric asked, I read is another nationwide summer program. Any plans to partner with them as well as CSLP? You know, I am not sure about that. We've, um, the CSLP partnership is um, pretty recent. Um, like I said, it's only the second year that we've partnered. So we're just kind of testing the waters. Um, and so far it's been very successful. It's a really exciting way for us to integrate health literacy into such a, um, a wide reaching program. Um, but so I can't really speak to that, but it's been really exciting so far, especially as a former youth librarian. It's, it's a really awesome partnership. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you so much to Tess. And now I'm going to have uh, Jennifer and Lisa um, give us a real world example of engagement from libraries. Yeah, so uh, we're at the Scotch Plains Public Library in New Jersey. And um, honestly, we are really ourselves just getting acquainted with what citizen science is all about. Uh, we were definitely inspired by uh, Darmeen's book, which arrived in our library um, not too long before we had to close the building. 
Um, and then once we were closed, it did seem like this was a fantastic thing to, um, to promote to our, to our community just because these are projects that can be done safely from home in isolation. Um, and also they just offer people a way to contribute something, make an impact, feel good about something that they're doing, which I think um, you know, people are looking for right now. Uh, so really we just created a couple of pages on our website. Uh, we added a banner to our homepage and then put up a couple of uh, WordPress pages. And they're really just meant to encourage um, people in our community to investigate SciStarter, um, to, to see, understand a little bit about what citizen science is and what they should look for when they get to the site. It's really intended as like a stepping stone um, from the familiarity of our site um, onto the SciStarter page. So, you know, our pages just basically give a little introduction to citizen science and then highlight a couple of things that, that we suggest people look for. Uh, we definitely wanted to direct people to the project finder um, because it really has this very neat feature where you can specifically search for projects that are done either exclusively online or just from your home, just so people realize that this is something that they can do right now. And then we just highlighted a few um, specific projects um, that I thought just looked neat, like I'm, I'm really excited about trying the ant picnic when the weather gets better. Um, just to give people an idea of the range of projects, there's really something for all ages, something for all interests. Um, and it's just intended to encourage people to go and get involved. Uh, and then at the end of the page, we, uh, you can go to the next slide, please. Thanks. Um, we highlighted one particular project again, so we all know about the, what's, what's so great about stall catchers. Now you've seen, uh, you know, how much fun it, it can be and how much of an impact it can really make. And I also, I think that the, the, the game element um, also makes it appealing. You earn points, you, um, you know, you, you advance levels. I think that's something that um, encourages people to stick with something, to keep coming back. I know that that's how it's working for me. I just want to go and get more points and get to the next level, um, you know, on top of, of the good science that it's creating. So we created another page again, that's um, like a stepping stone uh, from our site to stall catchers. And we are encouraging, we did create a team. Uh, so far, my colleague Lisa and I are, are the only members so we're definitely looking to create some, some live of stall catching events and try to get our community to, to get involved. So we're, we're looking forward to, you know, a, a long time of getting involved and, and encouraging spreading the word about citizen science to our community. All right, awesome. Thank you so much to Jennifer. Lisa, before I describe the Maine State Library, do you have anything to add about your work? No, I just wanted to, you know, be here with Jennifer, but um, we've been really, the timing just ended up being so interesting for us with um, wanting to get this off the ground and then all of a sudden everybody's at home and it felt like, you know, let's let's encourage people to do this while they're home. You know, so it's 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 been interesting, and we're looking forward to trying to get something a little more off the ground. Awesome! Thank you so much, Talisa. Um, so before we all leave today, um, I'm gonna quickly uh, describe another library example. Um, Annika Black from um, Maine told us about what the Maine State Library has been doing. They've just been doing simple live streams every week, and could be as simple as you know, hooking up your computer, um, going on Facebook Live and engaging with your participants in that way. Um, so you do what works for you. You could do stall catchers live on Facebook Live. You could be like the main state library and do um, an activity on bugs and then perhaps pair it with a citizen science project. Um, and then once you have an event, you know, if, you, if you're a citizen scientist who wants to meet with other citizen scientists online and do an event, if you're a part of a library staff and you wanna plan an event, we hope you add it to SciStarter.org forward slash events. Here's an example from the LA Public Library. Um, they're celebrating Earth Day tomorrow. Um, 
by doing a virtual project where you can help scientists trace patches of kelp in the ocean. And this is a public event, so you all, if you're interested, are welcome to attend. So in conclusion, um, we just wanted to thank you for being here, for celebrating Citizen Science Month, and we hope that you find more online events, that you're able to read the field guide to citizen science, um, access those projects from the National Library of Medicine at scistarter.org forward slash NLM. You can do those from home as a citizen scientist or organize programs around them online. Um, and we just hope that Citizen Science Month becomes Citizen Science Life. Any other words from our panelists before we go? And please drop your questions in the chat if you all have them. Thank yeah, you all for coming. Um, sorry, don't don't be afraid to reach out. I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions about the NNLM or all of us, anything like that. Thanks everyone for coming. Yeah, and I'm happy to stay on the line a little bit longer if people wanna keep asking questions as well. I enjoyed the I enjoyed the presentation too. Great, we're getting lots of um, thank yous in the chat. I don't really see any more questions yet. Um, someone asked, how does the team process work for stall catchers? Are there explicit instructions on how to do this and invite our community members? Yes, um, all of that's on stall catchers. We urge you to make a SciStarter account first and then sign up on stall catchers with the same email so you're able to track your contributions in your SciStarter dashboard. But once you have your SciStarter account and your stall catchers account, um, you can go ahead and make a team and then you can use a link that stall catchers generates for you to invite others to join your team. So I have team SciStarter that you all are welcome to join or you could join Jennifer and Lisa's team and give us a run for our money. So it's up to you or make your own. Yeah. Another thing, because I see questions here that these these resources stay here even after Citizen Science Month. So Citizen Science Month webpage was put up to help in anticipation of planning events and people finding events. But we'll keep that up for for a long time. And then all the other sub pages. And I know it's confusing because you have SciStarter and then you have 15 other pages that we've shown you and SciStarter. It is definitely a little tricky. They're all alive and they will stay alive for a long time as well. Um, and I also just wanted to say that perhaps, you know, these questions are great coming in. I've seen other um, demonstrations where somebody takes their computer outside. So, you know, librarians and staff, if you want to give virtual field trips to your, your patrons, you can do citizen science projects in your backyard or from home and just let them see you do it. You know, the, some of the pollinator ones or the nature ones, there's a, yeah. City Nature Challenge is happening this weekend. There's lots of different opportunities to for you to facilitate citizen science like Caroline and, and our team have here. Caroline too, um, we were talking the other day and she pointed out a ton of really awesome projects you can do um, with any pets you might have at home. So that's another option as well. There are some really great options that you can do just at your own home as well. You could promote those to folks. I thought they were really exciting. <laughs> Great. And speaking of those, I'm going to drop that link in the chat just because I love these projects. We did a blog post on um, five ways your dogs can do science. Woof. And there's one for cats too. Um, let me drop the cat project in here. Any other questions from folks before we all go? I think you have to get permission from your cat to do those projects though. <laughs> There's one study called Cat Tracker Personality where you um, can fill out a survey about your cat and um, uh, help scientists at North Carolina State University better understand what makes cats tick, you know, why cats are the way they are. <laughs> uh, there's a question here about whether or not you need to have funding to start a project. That's a great question. You don't need to have funding to add it to SciStarter or for any of the services and resources that we showed you today. Um, there are, if you wanna build a kit for your library or get one, and those fees are just whatever the materials cost from Amazon. But you don't wanna start a project for the heck of starting a project because once you get volunteers invested in your project, just be mindful of the fact that they took time out of doing something else to be part of your project. So if you don't have the the funds or the resources to sustain whatever citizen science project you're thinking of starting, don't start it. 
-hmm. just join somebody else's project and point people to that. And of course, uh, you know, when you mentioned that, I went, you know, I had written down a note to talk about the IMLS funding and LSTA grants uh, here in Arizona, um, with the success that we had with our, our partner libraries uh, this past year, our state library um, approved uh, LSTA micro grant funding for citizens up to $3,000 for citizen science kits and projects uh, here in Arizona. So uh, we got some, some libraries that uh, applied for that and we're hoping that that's something that we can expand nationwide uh, to state libraries across the country. And if there are health um, health related activities and programming that you'd like to do, um, you can reach out to me or go on the NNLM website and find your region. Um, reach out to them. We're always happy to, my equivalent in, in your region, uh, I'm sure would be happy to, to come up with programming ideas, talk to you about funding opportunities. Um, we're always really excited to, to talk to new partners. All right. Uh, looks like Albert just said in the chat, if you can go out at night, the Lyrid meteors are visible tonight with clear skies. Ooh, this is a good time to do one of the projects on scistory.org forward slash astronomy. I'll drop that in the chat. <laughs> That's a good tip. <laughs> Maybe the dark sky one too, but yeah, the astronomy one would be good. And Dan, Dan and Tess, did you, did you say already that NNLM, I know you mentioned the funding resources, that the regional offices also, um, this, this may be a way for people to get support to get the kits and put the kits in your library that Dan had shown earlier. I know that the Pacific Southwest, is that right? Which one is Kelly Ham with? I know she, you know, yeah. offices give out grants. If your library is thinking about the kits that Dan showed earlier and the programs that comes with the marketing materials, you know, because of the digital resources from SciStarter, it's probably a good place to check out to see if you can get support for your kids. A hundred percent. And um, like I said, yeah, we, we, uh, we have funding cycles that open up um, at least every year, once a year. Um, last year, we had a couple cycles um, that we went through and we worked with a number of libraries, but also community organizations. Um, and we work with not just, uh, our name can, can be a little misleading because people think you have to be a medical library. Um, some people think you have to be a medical library to join the network. That's not the case. We love working with public libraries, school libraries, academic libraries, um, libraries of all kinds and community-based organizations as well. So yeah, take a look at grant opportunities in your region because um, they pop up, they pop up all the time and, and they're, we like to think creatively about how how that money is spent. And I just want to remind people, we started with the Field Guide to Citizen Science. By the way, this was designed to be very low cost so that you can, it's affordable. We just want it to be accessible, but also free digital versions from your library. Please check that out too. Um, and then I guess we can close here, right, Caroline? Definitely. I'm just going to show this slide one more time. Um, our guide to how to access the field guide to citizen science through library e-media. Great. Well, co-panelists, thank you, Caroline. You always save the day. Amazing. Keep things moving. Everybody who joined us, it looks like there were 108 people who joined online, 63 still with us. That's awesome. Something over 200 people that registered and everybody who registered will get a link, a follow-up email from us with a link to this presentation and the slides, um, links to everything that we talked about in chat. And then of course, a survey for our evaluators to see what you, what you liked about our work here. Thank you very much. Go do some citizen science, stay safe. And it's been great to see you. Bye everybody. Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye everyone. Happy citizen Have science. <laughs>